labor is the source of wealth and all culture. And since useful labor is possible only in society and through society, the proceeds of labor belong undiminished with equal rights or equal right, sorry, to all members of society. There's a lot of this where he is just being a prick. <laughs> uh, Marx, Marx yeah. do you mean? Oh yeah, no, I mean, he... This is why I this is why I make the comparison to retweets. Like he really <laughs> hammers home, like he's hammering home on all, on all fronts, all rhetoric used on this. And again, to much to our point before, um, <clears throat> he is he is make he's he's doing a fantastic job at basically pr- using in practice. Um, I guess what we were kind of poking at with things like you know with Corbin Sanders again things that you know are fantastic in essence. And yes, things that we shouldn't things that we shouldn't necessarily consider ourselves above as like bougie leftists. We should, we can at least you know things that we actually look around and go, look, you know, as a popular as a popular front, can we agree these things are good? These things are absolutely awesome, but only understand that they're useful as a, as something to move beyond. Um, I don't see like that. I I I have experienced this recently with a lot of people that I know who've become, let's say, quote unquote, radicalized by the Bernie Sanders movement or by Corbyn. Um, But when you really get down to it, they absolutely, they absolutely see that as a, as a finishing point that in, that is the means to an end because it's, it's, Perhaps it is a better case uh, than, say, what the Tories or what Trump mm. are putting out, of course, of course. But at the same time, where I feel that Marx's critique here is so useful is because it does, um, I feel it at least implies that there is something beyond this. We can take some of these key features that you're putting out here, but first and foremost, we need to be specific. We also need to <laughs> underline, look, this is some liberal bullshit here. This is some bourgeois, very close-minded, very tunnel-visioned, sort of whatever your socialism is kind of stuff. But these, these points are great. Like, I don't think he's actually even saying anywhere within the text, like scrap the whole thing. It's gone to shit. Yeah. Like, yeah throw it out yeah. the window. He's just asking for uh, more. Specifications is quite, quite a lot of what he's looking for, isn't it? Um, I think so. And I think they're, that But it's like, they're, they're essential specifications because of the, the wideness, like just, if you, uh, I, I, I we'll see more as we go through them. But if you, if you take the wording, and I think uh, he mentioned that a lot of this is taken from um, either the first international or the. Um, I think it's the first international. Yeah. Um, and it, the, the the phraseology is sort of softened or or, or be, becomes more vague, and mm. it's that openness. And I think that's Marx's ultimate point. It's that openness, that like shaving off the the, the hard edge of these phrases, uh, leads to shit like uh, uh, the the most or the first European revolutionary socialist uh, party um, becoming or uh, standing for fucking uh, imperialist warlords and mm. uh, shooting poor fucking Rosa Goddamn Luxemburg. Um, she was she? Uh, so. Yeah, but, but the the the, par- the the sort of the parallel or not the parallel I guess the parallel to your point there is that like he is um he's just after as far as I know I think it's he's just after written his head is fully immersed in putting capital together uh, mm. volume one so it's so it's like um his first point against uh that point labor being the source of all wealth and culture. And like the, I mean, it can't but be pedantic, like to just go, oh, labor's not the source of all wealth. Nature is just as much as a source of uh, of use value as labor is. I've just written a nine hundred page tome on it. Like, <laughs> have you not read it? Do you know what I mean? <laughs> if this if this text has secured anything in my mind about Mer- uh, about Marx, it's it's definitely that he's he's fucking pedantic. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, with all good reason, with good reason again. Good reason, with good but, absolute reason. But he's he's definitely a a pedant. <laughs> so I mean, like, okay, so like, if I if I wrote if I if I did some work and I wrote uh, and I wrote it out and you know my head was fully immersed in it and you oh. wrote a, a unity program for um, a political party and you said that like um, I can't 
think quick enough of a, of a, of a parallel, but you said labor is the source of all wealth. And in my work, I was like, I made a key point, but not like, not, not like a killer point that actually nature is just as much a source of uh, wealth as labor is. But, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, I don't think I'd, um, I'd approach it the, this, with the same harshness. I'd go, ah, oh, no, Ollie, hang on a second. Um, let me refer you to the page in the work I've has he even published at this stage. <laughs> um, yeah. So. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, he basically starts off by going, first of all, <laughs> <laughs> it's just like it's his first fucking line but yeah no he refers to the various instances in i guess the material world where um yeah wealth is generated and and you know it's not just confined to so, uh, to society in this regard and I, I can't remember if in this passage does he actually hammer them down on like specifying what what do you what do you mean by society yeah. so that's like, that's the key that's the um that's the what i was referring to there the like so there's the pedantic stuff but there's the um the shape the softening the uh the hard edges so putting in society there it's um so where is it through society all members of society have an equal right to undiminished proceeds of labor so if um Society could be imagined in any sort of way uh, by any sort of person with any sort of philosophy or ideology or um, perspective on the world. Mm -hmm. um, so Marx says, like, society here is useless, uh, can easily mean the state of private property. And if you, if you think, okay, so here's society, it's a container for all the activity of human people on the planet. Um, it doesn't matter how it's ordered. That's just what it is. Um, and every single um productive element of that society has an equal right to the undiminished proceeds of that production um since useful labor can only be performed in and through society society therefore can be taken to mean a very specific ordering of that containment of all human activity Mm -hmm. um and 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 marx's point there meaning it, it could mean the state or private property so like you can easily have a capitalist society where all labor um all the proceeds of labor because labor can only be performed through capitalism in this instance uh they have an equal right to the undiminished proceeds of labor but you know it has to go through this social order first and um society therefore when it's when your equal rights to undiminished proceeds of your labor is filtered through society, society, uh, the word society in whatever order, shape, form, um, it becomes the repository of production and then its distributor. So it receives the production and then redistributes the production. And I just don't, and, and that, yeah, that's, uh, it just lends itself to 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 a class situation. It's not classlessness, I don't think, and um, and I think that's the the first sort of hammer blow. Um, there. Anything else on that, or? Um, yeah, no, I think I think yeah. What the? It's mostly that it stood out to me was yeah. Marx is calling them out on not even not just the various not just the the way things are worded, but what's implied by the words they're using. He's calling for what can more. Be implied. Exactly. Sorry. What can be implied. It's sort of, he's asking for the clarity that um, he hammers through this entire text with. Mm. Um, but again, and, and, and this is just to, 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 to hammer myself, to relay it back to, to my, my point I made a minute ago. Again, <laughs> I, I, I think this is just evidence of, of Marx's seeing not, not only under underlining the, the, the po the the possible the plausible liberal bourgeois uh, merit or base to some of these points, but again, what he sees past it, um, because, and again, I think this is maybe I'm jumping the gun on this. Maybe Marx hasn't quite reached that point yet in some of his theory and analysis, but I get that feeling towards the end where he starts to discuss the um, when he discuss starts to talk about things when he starts discussing when he becomes concerned with that, you know, what is state, what is meant by, what is meant by state in this document um, for him to hang up, like referring back to this and then referring back to how he hung up, he gets on what is society and what can be implied by 
as you pointed out, like a, it could it could imply a particular structure um, that doesn't necessarily lend itself to the kind of socialism perhaps that Marx is talking about or the progression into where Marx would see, say, the progression into communism. Mm. It, it could even, you know, it could be that, you know, passing through into that place where you have, you know, we're moving away from capitalism, but we find ourselves in that kind of, you know, um, kind of like the way riverboats go down in, in, in locks. We find yeah, ourselves yeah, yeah. in that lock. But, it, but even Marx would say, that lock area, that, that place we'll find ourselves in, will still have hangovers from capitalist society. Yeah. And for some people, perhaps that is what they envision as a socialism. That's why I was making the point about Bernie Sanders or Corbyn. We could find ourselves there, but if not, if we don't, if we, if we get stuck there, there, if there's no view or vision to move past that, um, it still lends itself back to your point. It lends itself back into being easily corrupted again or uh, reabsorbed back into the kind of a uh, sort of only slowed down, perhaps snowball of capitalism. Absolutely. There was, God damn it. There was a, um, there was a point to follow on through from that about similar to the Marx having just written capital point, but uh, sort of more pertinent, but I, I, I can't, it, it's not coming back to my mind now. So hopefully down the line, um, I'm, I'll move on with the, with the next one. Hmm. Um, in present society, the capitalist class has a monopoly of the instruments of labor. The resultant dependence of the working class is the cause of misery and servitude in all its forms. Uh, that was your point. You've, you've made this point, I think, already. Um, the key point here is that Marx outlines the, uh, the capitalist class should denote landowners as well as capitalists. Hmm. Um, oh, that was it. Um, the, regarding the state and regarding why um, Marx might have made that first point um, so vehemently, LaSalle, uh, Wiki told me, LaSalle uh, was... Uh, a social monarchist, a monarchical socialist. Hey, he was big into the state uh, and um, like quite, uh, you know, not, not, I, I have no idea if he was nationalist in terms of like Hitler was nationalist, but, um, but he was definitely German re- reunification and uh, was working with Bismarck uh, for, uh, for universal male suffrage and um, stuff like that. So, uh, and, and yeah, had written, written to Engels, um, something about like, he was convinced that if it was at all possible, a, a, a monarchical, monarchical, monarchical socialism, uh, would be ideal. So, I mean, so like it, knowing someone in that respect, um, and, and their sort of zeal for the, the, the nation state, which, you know, didn't actually exist at the time. I don't think, uh, it's, it's developing, in the decades um, that follow, but um, yeah, you you can see sort of you don't need a lens as such when you're when you're that familiar with someone to know where they're coming from when they're talking about society and implying the state and stuff like that. Oh. Um, so yeah, sorry. Um, have you have you written more on two? I think uh, all I have was the. Um, the capitalist class should denote landowners as well as capitalists. Yeah, I think that was really all that I pulled out of it. It just seemed like, yeah, again, Marx is hung up on that. Again, with the same the same reasoning that he's using throughout is just to say, you know, again, and actually, you know, to our to our point as well, that sounds great. It probably looks fantastic on a banner or in a slogan or in a newspaper. But what's implied there, and I guess this might actually this might be to Marx's point, maybe from having a bit more understanding of what LaSalle had been talking about in life. Um, and, you know, we're seeing an influence here, but perhaps it was more condensed in writings of his or whatever, um, or, or, or conversations that were happening around the time of his life um, that maybe express a lot more of this. And perhaps this is Marx just being very wary of again the language used there what can that be what can be implied there and if as you said he yeah, was why a, wasn't he seeking monar- to attack a monar- yeah if he was a, a monar a monarchical a maniacal socialist um monar- you know monarchical. yeah why, why um, wasn't yeah. he seeking to attack the landowners explicitly and stuff like that 
Well, exactly. Because again, I think, and what is it? Um, does Marx say it himself in there? I think he says that not all capitalists are, uh, I think he says not all capitalists are necessarily landowners. Hmm. Um, and so, yeah, to his point, he's just saying, no, 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 there's more to this. There's much more to this. And you're not, you're not encompassing the whole, the whole, the whole thing. Um, yeah. Or at least, but you're, you're aristocracy least... still like still has still plays a role today, doesn't it? You know, Do you know. Like I, I was thinking, hmm. do, do I have the book here? I do. The um, oh, trick me, oh, there it is. Yeah, like um, this old picture of um, capitalist society. You know the the, 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 the aristocracy like wedding a wedding cake. Yeah, that one. The aristocracy, you know, do and the church are still sort of like top tier in society. Whenever this was, um, I'd love if the information on the picture was just there but it's not um and the um you'd imagine the you'd imagine really like the the what the middle class is that coming up yeah yeah, that's yeah, okay clearly what the middle class like there that's probably business that's probably capitalism do you know what i mean they're probably the ones that are um doing a capitalism mm. Uh, well, obviously, the working class are the ones doing it. Capitalism, they're the ones fucking <laughs> making everything. But, um, could, you know, pulling the strings and stuff. And it's... Um, the uh, I can't... Yeah, just... So, obviously, their their heads roll in France and American society, like even in Gotha Program, R- Marx refers to American society being the society of La Salle actually... Um, or the Unity Program, sorry, actually amounts to um, seeking to pursue... But um, I know, I mean, okay, so what, like, in today, the, the middle class is just um, the, the, the layer of society that has almost a, a shot, like the managerial and professional um, layer of society that has a, a sort of a shot at um, achieving home ownership. That appears to be the middle class. And, and while, while the conditions for such were ideal, true social democracy um in in the us and europe that middle class has been like hollowed out as fuck and um you know it's you know it's it's still it's still working class like it's still it's it's relationship to the means of production are still fucking non-existent like or or non-existent of course in terms of control a controlling relationship is non-existent Mm. um and and so the middle class sort of in, in Marxism, I guess, is still that the manager, the petty bourgeois, um, the managerial sort of bootlickers, I guess. But like you know that picture, that and, and it's not necessarily written based on a Marxian analysis, of course. Um, but that picture sort of denotes um, really the middle class are probably. In the, in the bottom tier as well there. Do you know what I mean? Sure. Like, really. So, my point is that in Europe, 100, 200 years ago, despite the prominence of capitalism uh, since the coming out of the 17th century, um, the aristocracy and the church, those old feudal institutions are still prominent and if if you were to if you were to an, an arbitrary if you were to draw an arbitrary structure of society uh based on that the capitalist class are probably the real middle class mm-hmm. if that makes sense oh um we should should we should we skip along do you want to read out three uh sure uh the emancipation of labor 
demands the promotion of the instruments of labor to the common property of society and the cooperative regulation of the total labor with a, f with a fair distribution of the proceeds of labor. Uh, I, I think I just, because I, I, there's quite a lot, I'm going to skip through um, quite quickly just the, the points I have down that Max mm -hmm. makes on this, and then we can, we can just sort of talk anything that, uh, that pops out. Sure. He asks, um, elevated to common property, not converted into common property, um, proceeds of labor, so vague, just distribution. Many argue the current distribution, uh, not just distribution, like only distribution, but just uh, distribution. Many argue that current distribution is just, as of course, if you're a capitalist, you would argue that the distribution, the, the wages that, uh, that labor get uh, is just uh, for the yeah. logic of capitalism. Mm -hmm. um, considered along point one, the undiminished proceeds requires everyone to work. Uh, if only those who work acquire access, then not everyone in society has equal rights to the proceeds. This needs untangling. Um, proceeds of labor uh, leads to the product of labor. Um, cooperative, the cooperative proceeds of labor is the total social product, and this total so, this total product must include. Um, so he's breaking down uh, the, the, the the concept of um, the total proceeds is it, it is quite diminished, regardless. Like even you know, like at the best of times, uh, because it goes, um, it has to cover the means of production used up uh, to make mm. more tools um additional portion for the expansion of the production to expand sure. the production uh, uh the reserve of insurance fund in case of accidents and disruption caused by natural calamities etc uh, sure i mean is that that's sorry that sorry you're including i guess that that fund you're talking about there that that sort of encompasses things like income taxes that's that's it's it's considering a, a hell of a lot of things no I wouldn't. I wouldn't have thought income tax. No, I, th I think this is um, in a, in a sort of a a first phase communism. Um, I'm sorry. I thought this was talking about the the idea of the diminished proceeds um, of labor, the diminished proceeds. But I thought for that for that what that what state does that diminished proceed land in? I guess is what I'm kind of poking point. at is that yeah, that's yeah, yeah. that's after a series of other. Um, I guess processes it has to go through, as you said, funds will be taken out of that. Obviously, you know, certain amounts of certain amounts need to go towards. Sorry, yeah, yeah, okay. So an income tax, yeah, yeah, just I yeah. Just, so an income tax, yeah, yeah I guess would be involved in there. Which I think, I think even I think Marx actually makes the point later on, doesn't he? He says something along the lines of like, to, so then with regarding all these kind of taxes and and various various extractions that have to yeah. occur, this implies. A particular wage bracket. Um, yeah. It actually implies but, what people are getting paid. So I think the issue is uh, it, it just that I I picked up there on was that the word income and where I was imagining um, actual production that like just mm. the 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 um, the products itself rather than any income being derived from having produced okay. uh, anything. And but it amounts to the same thing. Uh, mm. If everyone's working, uh, making things a portion of those products will be taken like a tax um, and uh, yeah, reserved for these to cover all these uh, extra things. Um, so proceeds of labor make no sense without exchange value. Labor spent no longer appears as value certificate of labor time as token for consumption, uh, emergent con communism not established. Um, I'm telling myself to look at the top of page three, four, six. Uh, so I think that's obviously sort of a key point, isn't it? And then the second key point is the one that follows, um, and maybe we can we can talk about that once we get through the through the section. But LaSalle's equal rights is still a bourgeois right, uh, and we'll get into that. Um, so just to finish off three reserving those two points uh we must accept these issues in the first okay so yeah this is all going on but first phase communism um in a more advanced phase distribution means consumption yeah so let's just talk about that then let's hit up the equal rights thing first mm. 
Um, I guess, I guess, fun. I guess, sorry, what I was actually saying there kind of walk, kind of walks into this because I mean, yeah, yeah. Just- I was saying about, yeah, the idea of an income tax and the, like, if we're talking about not necessarily, um, if we're talking about, you know, LaSalle in his program or no, sorry, not the, the parties in their program with the LaSallean influence, they're talking about this idea of this diminished. And, and again, stop me if I'm misinterpreting this, um, this idea of the diminished proceeds. And I, yeah, I would understand that as, okay, so, you know, after it's all come down through all of these processes, then that is quote unquote, fairly distributed um, is my understanding. Like the diminished amount. So obviously that's, that's after various things have been subtracted from it to upkeep, upkeep things. But, and why the point I bring up things like income taxes um, again, and I think this is what Marx is poking at again, is this idea of if you um, imply any kind of taxation in that regard, it it also implies wage brackets. It implies that people are making a certain amount of money, mm. which again, outside of, I suppose, what, you know, what in theory, all these, you know, these parties are trying to work towards. And I guess what Marx is kind of getting at there is like, um, and again, I don't know if this is at that point where Marx is really trying to push towards this stateless, moneyless idea of communism, like that it's going to be a process, but it's something to push towards. Yeah. This idea of any kind of taxation, it 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 if it's going to exist, well, then it implies that there needs to be, I guess, that exchange of money in order, or the the generation of wealth in order for that taxation to occur. But to imply a tax, uh, sorry, I'm sort of repeating myself here because I'm also trying to walk through the point. Yeah, yeah, question. Um, stumbling rather than walking, but stump. But I'm getting there. I'm getting there. Um, yeah, it, it, yeah, almost. Sorry. Yeah, like sort of. Down a hill backwards. Um, but yeah, it implies, it implies a wage bracket, which again, does not necessarily lend itself to what I think, you know, at least, you know, everybody was trying to push towards here in theory. Um, because again, it easily rolls backwards, doesn't it? It easily rolls back into this idea of, you know, a, a wage bracket, people making more than each other, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it'll just, it, it, I could easily see that kind of walking itself backwards back into comfortably back into the situation that we mm. still find ourselves in. Um, but I think maybe that's where Marx is just asking for more clarity on these things. Again, when we're talking about fair distribution, as yeah. you said, does the capitalist not think, you know, does the capitalist, does the supervisor, does, does, you know, does the bourgeois trader not consider the way that they operate in business to be fair? Do they not consider the wages they pay their, their, their staff uh, to be fair? Um, I actually, sorry, and I know I always bring this back to Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, um, <laughs> yeah. specifically the Muppets Christmas Carol, <laughs> because that's, that's my education. Um, I, there was a sentence in it that I completely forgot that um, I was watching it recently with my wife and we were, and I, I heard it and I thought, ah, every time I've tried to make a point about Marx and Charles Dickens, this makes it. Um, <laughs> There is a particular sentence where uh, Bob Cratchit is trying to explain uh, why it's customary to take Christmas Day, the entire day, off for Christmas. Because the, 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 the exchange between him and Scrooge is, but Scrooge, to Scrooge, there's like no concept of this. He's like, why would mm-hmm. you, well, how long do you need to take off? And he says, well, it's customary to take the entire day. And his exact words are, um, it's a poor excuse to pick a man's pocket on December 25th every year. And when I was younger, obviously, I just heard this kind of wrong because I didn't really understand it. But obviously, looking at it from a Marxian lens, obviously, it's exposing to me this logic that says he sees himself as being stolen from in this regard. (laughs) So his sense of fairness, is it not fair that we work all day, every day, every year? But of course, because we're generating money and I'm paying you to be there. Surely that's fair. Surely this exchange is fair. Whereas, and he sees this idea of, well, we need the day off because it's Christmas. It's Christmas day. Um, We need the whole day. We need the whole day. Exactly. It's seen as theft. When, um, when the, when the capitalist has invested in, um, in the means of production. So when, when the setup is there, like for it to be idle is, yeah, is, will, will come across as theft. It's like, mm-hmm. well, I've invested in this. I need to see the return. God knows what will happen tomorrow. And uh, that, that just needs to be maximized. So absolutely, yeah. Mm-hmm. 
and, and I guess, then, of course, yeah, under that logic, um, the distribution that happens in capitalism then is is just because, uh, uh, what was it, seniors last hour? Uh, because apparently, you know, the labor is working 10 hours of an 11 hour a day all for itself and the profits only made in the 11th hour supposedly mm. so 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 if 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 we all, if we all stop for a 10 hour day then well the capitalist has, uh, has what's the point <laughs> mm. <laughs> what's the point so so every what the point there is that everything um, given to um to a laborer for those 10 hours is uh, is just mm. And anything the capitalist takes for himself from that one hour is just also for them. <laughs> um, the the yeah that 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 bridges. So I, think, I mean, there's two key points. Like the uh, where the hell's it gone? The first point where you, small one about equality. Uh, I'm sure that you were talking about. I mean, I mean, ba- yeah. So the un- the idea that he- the thing he's poking at uh, to return to that is like the if it's if it's undiminished proceeds, um, everyone has to work, and uh, if if only those who work acquire access, then not everyone in society has equal rights to the proceeds. Uh, mm-hmm. So so in terms of untangling that, um, he he uh, he. Jumps down or jumping down, he he goes like uh, LaSalle's equal rights is still a bourgeois right. Um, well, only principle and practice are no longer. Oh yeah, yeah. So uh, only principle and practice are no longer in contradiction. So I think that means um, the principle of liberal equality um, is held as a social value, but actually in in liberal capitalism, the practice of that equality. Um, is a total failure so it's um i think in in our in our first series this this sort of came across in terms of um the the extension of equality and liberty liberalism was was limited to the bourgeois because they disdained of the um the way the emergent working class lived um you know being Having having no immediate access to wealth, um, uneducated and dirty and all that, uh, and and reliant on one another. Uh, I think that was that was uh, the um, episode four on Laclau. I think we covered that, and so the principle of equality, of like human equality, the human subject, uh, an individual unit from a species, the human species, uh, as distinct to whatever treatment people received under feudal um feudality, uh, the you know, kings and kings and um and and popes. And um to you know th- th- this sort of ideology was was developed to protect that like to to, in, to articulate an individual as a in terms of being like, uh, there was a sanctity to it, and, and a va- an intrinsic value to the individual itself. So to protect itself from being lumped together by uh, a total, a totalizing um, power, and um, except what happened, of course, is that only a specific class got extended this liberty. Um, so that's the practice of it is in contradiction. So all the sal. LaSalle's or a LaSallean program would do is um is extend that um that equality but but Marx is bringing up but but how is that even possible and you know that's that's one of the big things the the misconceptions of Marxism and communism it's all about being it's all about equality whereas actually he's saying well equality is is that sort of um is the the liberal like a like a like a concept from liberalism which is a, a mm. bourgeois philosophy and uh, you know how however are we even to like what what does it amount to if we have mm. if we have it um it, it's not necessarily any sort of freedom and um 
the early point he makes then, the one he says that needs untangling. It's um, if everyone, if it, yeah, he's he's just weighing those two things up. And I think you put either for a similar point or a different point, but like in a similar way, if uh, like weights, he's like sort of trying to weigh up the um, the value between like an equality, like a total equality of outcome. Like, like everyone should just get the same no matter what happens and then your your undiminished proceeds gets diminished quite quickly mm-hmm. or your sort of equality and i'm not going to say in terms of uh opportunity but equality in terms <laughs> of um we have to be careful keywords they'll they'll pick that up and lump us in with with his uh, that, hey that would be no bad thing <laughs> yeah but you never know um <laughs> the the sort of the quality of what you receive for your natural endowments. Mm -hmm. So each individual is, um, is unequal in terms of their natural endowments. Um, we can have a society that fully smooths those equalities or inequalities out. And that's a form of equality or because a lot of people would uh, perceive that as being unfair and a lack of equality because someone who um, is providing less is getting relatively more Uh, Mm. nominally the same, but because they're providing less, therefore they're getting relatively more. So there is, is an equality in that mer- meritocratic aspect, mm-hmm. uh, even though the outcome. Uh, it, well, I mean, yeah, I mean, it can be it can be articulated as being uh, equal as well, but the nominal outcome is is unequal. Uh, so th- that distinction, uh, he, I, I think, what is, is he coming? He's not coming down on such. I think he's he's getting out of. So he's getting out of um, having to come down on that by by sort of uh, articulating the first phase of communism as opposed to the advanced communism. So it's like um, he's saying we must accept these issues. The um, Let's pick it up from um, the... LaSalle's sort of equal rights is proportionist to lay a uh, proportional to labor undertaken, but this may be done at different rates under various capacities. That's what I'm saying. The equal right is an unequal right for unequal labor. Mm-hmm. Um, while there is no class as everyone is a worker, it gives tacit recognition. And this is the point you were making that where we can walk back from or things can roll back from. It gives um, tacit recognition to individual endowment as natural privileges unequal just like every other right and um, so he's he's just cr- criticizing the sort of the liberal human rights framework which i mean mm-hmm. amazingly doesn't really get to become articulated until you know at the end of the world war ii or whatever mm-hmm. i mean i guess like is a way of kind of articulating the way that that I guess just another way of articulating what you're saying, just to visualize it in my head. I mean, so yeah, you can have a situation in society in this particular instance. Um, as you said, someone who perhaps is working less. Now that could be down to various reasons, uh, but to give it, say, for example, to give it a to give it a, a, a signifier, say, for example, someone on um, with some means of disability. Um, obviously, based on taking into consideration what the necessary labor that is kind of needed in this instance obviously they can only work up to whatever amount that they can um if they're seen to be getting then the same an equaled share as everyone else um that could generate as you said that that kind of feeling of unfairness coming from other people um i would also assume that the other side it could also but it also implies i guess that the more abled uh, party in that in in on that that poll, <laughs> um, that that may encourage them in turn 
to work twice as much, three times as much, four times as much, because they simply can. But based on the idea of owning more, it, yeah, could, yeah, inc- yeah. it, could, it implies this, that it, somewhere within that logic, it could bore back into this idea of, well, if that person is going to make just as much as me, but I could work more, then I should get more. And that those sort of conversations, those kind of arrangements will, it becomes a fertile sort of ground for those kind of arrangements to, to appear. Precisely. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like on that, that sort of scale, yeah, you could see it, both of those things becoming a thing. So I guess, yeah, I think Marx isn't necessarily axing again he's not axing the whole thing he's just saying take a much deeper look at well, where your idea of equal rights are being born out of yeah i mean and like it like i like us getting towards the uh he he sort of um comes up with the the first phase to sort of uh to straddle this to to navigate this um to, to equalize outcomes the inequality of a person's given situation both natural and social must result in unequal rights and this has to be accepted um, in this first phase of communism. Uh, right can never rise above the economic structure of a society. A right uh, can never rise above the economic structure of a society and its contingent cultural development. Uh, not 100% clear on what that means, the, the sort of latter part of it, but certainly, I mean, it, it, it's clear that he's saying the sort of, well, I don't know, is he saying like normatively, like the right, the human right shouldn't sort of um, be placed above the the economic structure because it's idealistic? Uh, Or is he saying that it's literally impossible to do so? Um, Either way, pushing forward a right uh, in contra to the economic realities of the society um, will, will cause will either, I suppose, this is a second dimension to, to, the, to the quandary, it'll um, pose a sort of either an outright antagonism and a conflict in the society that will destabilize it and, and, and keep it sort of um, off kilter, or it'll, um, cause us, it'll just be redundant. And, and poss- I suppose in our society, uh, human rights are redundant Based because of the um, the economic structure of society, um, mm-hmm. you know, uh, early early seventies um, civil rights movement in America uh, gain gain sort of uh, protected rights for for African Americans, and just at a time when uh, social democracy is on the wane, um, the the global uh, economy is in a bit of free fall and uh, neoliberalism is about to take hold. And um, so regardless of whatever rights that could have helped um, a minority position in under social democracy to gain a foothold in that society uh, because of the economic structure of that society um, or, uh, you know, in, in that particular moment, it's they're locked in. Their position is locked in. Like there is no more opportunity under the economic realities. So the rights become meaningless. And uh, um, so many of um, so many people in that situation um, are still fucking struggling uh, despite those rights a half a century later. Yeah. Century later. Um, As you said, they, they got their rights just in time for for everything, everything to hit the fucking fan again to stay the exact same yeah uh, and, and 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 i think that's like that's the um like the the essence of the issue with uh bourgeois liberalism is that it's um sort of reliance on capitalism like it, it displaces an outright authoritarianism to hmm. the system like you know there's no there's no Mussolini, there's no hitler um there there's just the system and the logic of the system, and we can't do anything about the logic of the system. So, like where Mussolini says, "Do something that's a dictat," dictat, um, and he's a dictator. You go and do it, but no one's saying anything. In in, in fact, in capitalism, the, the the rulers are saying, "Oh, here we love you. Have all these rights." Sure, but yeah. they're you know, yeah, the, and it, Nick, 
sorry, go ahead. Go no, ahead. no, go ahead. I was going to say, I, I mean, it feels, it feels as if, and I mean, you know, if we're analyzing this correctly, it feels, it feels very similar to, to again, some of the, the current conversations that are going on where people are attempting to re to, to try and not necessarily refocus everything on as if there's one scope or lens that we should be looking at things through, but to bring back into focus, I suppose the material conditions Mm -hmm. that we're living under. And I think, whereas again, this focus on, um, I mean, in this is in the instance I'm discussing, I think probably that would, could be interpreted as verging more towards the, uh, the kind of material and culture, um, dichotomy that's currently going on a lot online amongst various circles. Go on, go on. But no, it's just, it's, it's simply to say that again, as you said, capitalism, it's, it's, it's capitalism is that with a smile, um, you do have, uh, it's 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 a it's a it's a father, uh, it's a parental figure, to a lot of people within its system. Um, you know, and again, we see this time and time again, the sort of corporate HR industry that's starting to blossom around things like diversity yeah. and inclusion. But actually, the reality of them couldn't be further uh, couldn't be further from what what were actually really what would actually be an authentic. I've got um I've got a I've got a picture of um I've got a picture of Black Lives Matter bunting in Argus, so I think that might have to be the thumbnail for this. Wow, Argus bunting Fair. in Argus. There you go. Um, That's, and and still I can't find a fake Karl's Mark Karl Marx beard to wear. In particularly in Argus, you think you'd buy particularly that? in Argus? Exactly, Poundland, I'd imagine, would have it. Like. Um, what's it gonna say? The but yeah, yeah, that was really just oh good. shit. That that point. Fuck. What? Um, god damn it, hopefully it'll come to me. Uh, but my follow up point is gone. The um, so yeah, he's straddling, he's straddling that that situation. He's saying, listen, uh, we, we've just got to accept these. Let's let's sort of let's put a put a burner on the right, um, not not a burner put them on the back burner (laughs) Um, and because 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 we're only talking about uh first phase communism here um and yeah 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 so the and backtrack through his notes um the proceeds of labor makes no sense without exchange value um labor spent no longer appears as value so um that's at the top of it yeah let's hit that the labor token the amazing labor token thing, the controversial, not controversial, but often talked about. Um, yes. Certificate of labor time as token for consumption in, in emergent communism, which hasn't been established yet. So that's, so he's, I, I guess he's, he's seeing, he's foreseeing the, the limits of uh, the, the burgeoning, I suppose, uh, framework, liberal framework for human rights. Uh, he's based on the that the um, those material relations of the economic um, base, and he's saying, you know, they're they're all nice and lovely, but they're meaningless uh, until um, you know further down the line. Maybe I mean he's not necessarily saying that, but like you know, he might as well be. And um, if if we're to sort of have a socialist struggle, then perhaps we just have to accept um, the realities uh, that, like you said, we're we're coming out of um, we're coming out of a given situation where cultural norms um, have for so long been determined by, to one degree or another, a meritocratic uh, situation, and in that situation. Um, a possible solution before uh, a more advanced phase of communist society is um, developed. Um, labor tokens is, well, yeah, a solution. Uh, and labor tokens being sort of something you can't exchange. And they're just, they're, they're just the, um, what you've worked and what you can get for, for that work. So it's just the mediation between 
because obviously if you are a if you're if you're a spud picker you're not just going to want to eat spuds and because there isn't a communist storehouse where everything is just um left and taken um you need the proof that you've that you're either you know the admin the um the recipient of emergency accidental um produce uh, or that you can't work you know so it's just it's it's the current system except with the exchange negated mm-hmm. uh i i've i've grown i've grown potatoes for this entire village um so i would like access to some ham yeah and that's the, I've, I've taken the labor token for i've taken the amount of labor tokens for for having grown all those potatoes and picking them and cleaning them and bagging them and distributing them and now i am using the tokens that 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 represent all that labor and i'm consuming other things than potatoes (laughs) yeah um so i I mean i think that's the essence of labor tokens Mm -hmm. i can't remember does does marx refer to in that passage or maybe it's in another text somewhere does he refer to like to how you would like deal with um countering like stockpiling of this kind of like these kind of tokens well I th- yeah maybe it's it maybe it is or it isn't in this but i think the whole point in it being a, like a certificate is that it's um that it's it's not exchangeable it's it's just attributable to you so you can't um so it's not like it way. has go on sorry go ahead go ahead no, I was just going to say, say <laughs> I was just going to say quickly that you you can't the only way you can accumulate them is by working by earning them. Sure. So it's not like something it there's no I guess yeah, what well, I guess what he's foreseeing there is the 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 possibility of it it becoming a sort of form of money, I guess. Uh if it starts to have a sort of exchange value Absolutely. um it, it it merits itself off to becoming something that people could stockpile yeah. and then perhaps charge you know say well okay listen you know i was going to give you you know i'll give you all these like i have like these five stubs for ham yeah and uh but i i want a little more than that because i think you really want this and especially so, especially if you like if you're a futurist and you see that like the value of ham is going to fucking shoot up you know in in yeah in the next season if it becomes rare if suddenly pigs just start we just we just we just have a bad season for pigs i don't know if, i'm not a farmer the, the 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 big distinction here is that um the liberal framework for um for an ideal society is based on these rights and marx is saying uh, you know given our given our situation given our society e- equal rights you can the, the word equal is is, is like just sh- like rough shot fucking no one no one can agree what it means uh, one person's equality is another person's inequality. So sure. let's let's isolate the um, issue in our society. And it's not inequality. And it's not equality. It's capitalism and it's exchange value. And it's how exchange value um, the money, 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 the, the money being the root of all evil. Take out the word evil, the moralistic aspect, money being the root of all downfall of our society um it, like yeah is inequality and, and actually it's yeah w- yeah without, without having to have all inequality equal rights mm. is is exactly that um it's absolutely producer. it really only tackles us i guess in this instance the lasalian kind of idea is only really i guess well sorry what marx is trying to imply is that it might only be it might only be the, um it might only be tackling uh, a surface tension, a surface issue, and again, as as you know, we pointed out in this this chat, like this idea of rights. Well, okay, absolutely, but what you know by by absolutely just smoothing over or, or give, you know saying okay, equal rights. Um, does that actually imply equal rights? Because exactly. most likely, what you inevitably find down the line is that they don't have fucking equal rights these get, people get be... to the point sort of thing like look, look exactly. at what's actually wrong with society yeah yeah you've got to tackle the root you've got to tackle the root so the um the juicy the juicy point then is mm-hmm. uh is is in a more advanced phase of communist society when the enslaving subjugation of individuals to the division of labor 
and thereby the antithesis between intellectual and physical labor have disappeared. So when we are no longer subject to the, um, the sort of the way labor is divided between people based on, I suppose, their natural and social um, uh, endowments, uh, when 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 the relations when the relationships between our between people in society with regards to doing labor is more democratic and more negotiable um when when that when being subject to that anti democratic situation that we exist in now has disappeared when labor is no longer just a means of keeping alive but it has become and and um by that uh just a means of being keeping alive uh, when when you when you are disenfranchised from the means of production as peasants were in feudal society uh alienated from their land which was bought out by more successful peasants than themselves in in the the arising of um of money rents um you 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 are forced in that situation to have to work to stay alive um and th there's no i mean for some reason that's still like debated but there's no there's no escaping that so uh when labor is no longer just a means of being of keeping alive but itself become a vital need and i think that means like the actual act of labor and not the not the not the working to get a wage to stay alive but like when it sure. becomes a need when you when you when you're doing it as a part of your life, like as a, as a, as a positive part of your life. Yeah. When the all round development of individuals has also increased their productive powers. So in the division of labor, if you're a, if you're a, if you're a cog in whatever machine and you're doing, and obviously this is industrial work, but I mean, to be fair, I think um, sort of third sector work is, is still quite repetitive. If you're doing that one aspect of the production line day in day out um it, it it sort of tears at your person so in the all-round development of individuals has increased their productive powers i would imagine that would mean when we're free to explore the possibilities of labor in that democratic classless situation post money post capitalism um we get to i think i think there's somewhere there's a marx actually quotes the sort of like um i could be this could be a hatchet job but like uh you know you work four hours a day of of obligatory communal production and then you spend the rest of your the working day in terms of like leisurely pursuits like and uh, productive but leisurely like fishing and whatever you want to go and try and do or whatever so mm. when that division of labor isn't foisted on you and you're not put in a position where you have to work to survive. And because you're doing that, you're doing something repetitively for your entire life. And it fucking wears you the fuck down. Uh, when, hmm. when late, when the world of labor opens up and it is for yourself, for your growth, for the growth of people around you. Um, and, and your productive powers are therefore increased instead of worn down hmm. and all the springs of cooperative wealth flow more abundantly because everyone's working for each other and, and are happy out. Yeah. Only then can society wholly cross the narrow horizon of bourgeois right and inscribe on its banner, ha ha, from each according to his abilities to each according to his needs. And that's Marx's equality. And, it, and, it, and it's the end game, like what we've been alluding to for the last half an hour. Mm. Uh, it's not the first step. It's, it's something that comes out of like a proper reworking of how we operate and rights rights are like a like a band-aid that will fall off and the scab emerges the distribution of the means of consumption is a consequence of the distribution of the conditions of production the distribution of the latter is a feature of the mode of production itself under capitalist mode of production the material conditions of production are in the la in the hands of non-workers property in the form of capital and land yes LaSalle land. While workers only have the personal condition of production, labor power, the means of consumption follows as it would be as it would if the conditions of production were placed in the hands of the workers. 
Distribution is not independent of the mode of production and should not be the focus of the socialist structure struggle. Oh, that's, sorry, I should have tailed off there. <coughs> Distribution is not independent of the mode of production and should not be the focus of socialist struggle. So, for all the social democrats out there, I mean, see, this is the big thing. Like, you can say something like this. You can say the... Um, you can say all these uh, like Marx's assertions, but there's no reason <laughs> you can go, oh, but look, Marx said that. And there's no reason for anyone to go like, uh, so what? Mm. No, there's no reason for anyone to go, oh, wow. <laughs> he said that, did he? Oh. I think that's a, that's an important, uh, important thing. I guess actually in our, in our um, season three, Marx for today, uh, coming winter 2021 um we, we we should definitely focus on that like i mean i guess we will like why that why why should we listen to marx hmm. but in lieu of proving the reason why uh let's amount his uh his key critiques and one of them being the uh, the idea that distribution is not dependent of the mode of production uh when um when when sort of when relations of production uh condition the um the well the conditions of consumption when they condition consumption um i i, I like marx is talking about the historical materialism here isn't he he's um if society is like if society through history is a combination uh, any given combination of these uh, key elements uh, of the economic base, basically the relations of production, how um, how production uh, is organized, I guess. I, I think that's the essence of it. Um, that's that's the sort of that combination is what uh, determines sort of everything else that he finds important in his analysis um that's where it all stems from so there's no point in focusing on sort of attenuating consumption in capitalism like trying to make it better for people um because the that economic base will always everything will always revert back to that moment and that's what you see in the um when social democracy really had its day, uh, you know, sort of, um, is it the, when does the Great Depression end? When's the, when's the, America's Great New Deal, whatever. Basically up until the interwar, the interwar um, period for America and the post-war period for Europe up until Thatcher and Reagan. Um, consumption keynesianism consumption focused um economics is is sort of has its tour de force um has its day the working class are are are, are given um a hell of a lot of um a hell of a lot more than they historically uh were given and yeah that 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 i mean the principle was that if, if we look after consumption, they'll look after capitalism, but they, we, the working class will look after capitalism. And, um, once, once the, once the reasons that those concessions were made in the first place being, um, the sort of sinking of capital assets into war bonds, into, into funding, the national um, efforts to defeat um, the enemy. I'm, I'm, I'm not determining that because I'm talking. It, it doesn't matter who won. The, the the sort of the ruling elites, the capitalists, will 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 have funded both efforts, and um, uh, their their assets were sunk. So it doesn't matter who won. That's that's where the money went. But also the um, the value of the commodity labor was increased because there were so few laborers around because they were all slaughtered in war. 
uh, in the two wars and um, and they had the upper hand. So capital was sort of scarce and labor was scarce and that gave, increased the leverage of labor. And um, while not, excuse me, while not um, altering the, the elements of the economic base fundamentally, the relations of production, it did, <clears throat> it did sort of um, affect it and it gave the Social Democrats the moment uh, to use that leverage to attenuate uh, redistributive um, issues and f- thus focusing on consumption, mm-hmm. um, the means of consumption. And um, so once, once labor was plentiful again and once capital accumulation had built up again, um, wealth was drawn from, from whatever sources, uh, um, I was going to say neocolonialism, but um, but I think that uh, that sort of comes really later. But I, mean, I suppose through through the health, the health that um, Keynesian economics um, provided for capitalism, the the um, the amount of capital accumulation was really sort of starting to wear. And when Thatcher and Reagan uh, came to power. They've they start imp- like putting in place policies. They felt that I, I guess the time was right um, for policy to be put in place, uh, where where that wealth started really coming to be extracted, and and the, the leverage that labor had, uh, and their status was diminished and eroded over time to to get to the point where we're at today. And that's sort of basically the the point um, Marx is making here. Uh, distribution is not independent of the mode of production. So while the policies were contingent and um, social democracy provided that moment for uh, about two generations um, of comfortable living and a job for life and uh, sort of decent enough labor regs and, uh, con- and you know, cushy consumer lifestyles and even home ownership. Mm. The actual mode of production wasn't changed. It wasn't. Mm. It proved. Well, it wasn't the target for for being contingent, and um, and eventually uh, consumption reverted back to its, um, which I'm sure history will prove its mean uh, under this mode of production. So yeah. I mean, hmm. it's more the same from what he was saying. It's like um, there's no point in no point in in um, focusing on equal rights, and there's no point in focusing on um, the means of consumption. Um, quite quickly, uh, the the rest of that, uh, the final two points in in section one. Uh, the emancipation of labor must be the work of the working class in relation to which all other classes are a single reactionary mass and the working class must initially work for its emancipation within the framework of the present uh, sorry present day national state conscious of the necessary result of its efforts common to the works of all civilized countries will be the international brotherhood of peoples um marx just says Class structures more nuanced. The lower middle class, for instance, would be subsumed under the proletariat. So um, I think we kind of sort of touched a little bit on um, superficially. I were, yeah, I mean, you were touching on it with the the illustration point, correct? I mean, like Su- superficially, I think ultimately, yeah. really, but the, not yeah. as in depth. Yeah, I was just going to say the um, the point being that um, it's. You know, he, he Marx is, is is almost saying, well, the South's being too combative there. That the um, the working class, uh, everyone but the working class, will um, is a single reactionary mass. And he's just like, well, no, that's that's ridiculous. Uh, <clears throat> the middle class will will will, you know, this is actually, yeah, sorry, that is what happened. The 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 lower middle class has been subsumed of under the proletariat um, because we didn't um, target the mode of production when capitalism was weak after the wars. Um, 
and it has now reverted back. So, so the growth of the middle class has been subsumed back under. <coughs> God, throw a real dry there. Um, under the proletariat, oh, well, under the working class. I, I don't know how sort of industrial the working class is in present day. Um, at least, at least this end of the world. And the second point being, um, I'll just finish that on the Sal's alliance with feudal opponents to the bourgeoisie. What does he not say there? Oh yeah, yeah. So I think Mark's a uh, uh, dig at dig at LaSalle for having for his alliances with feudal opponents to the bourgeoisie. Uh, I guess he's talking about Bismarck there. Mm. Um, but are they not all reactionary class? <laughs> and this part, of course, was reactionary. Or so Wikipedia told me. Um, I, I know a bit more than that about Bismarck, thankfully. The last one, LaSalle approached the workers' movement from the narrowest national point of view. And um, that reverts, that we've touched on that already. Uh, what Wikipedia also told me, that um, his, 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 uh, his, Pursuit, LaSalle's pursuit of uh, German reunification or, or unification, sorry, not reunification. And um, uh, I mean, I guess there must have been some sort of patriotism there and, and particularly like this idea of a, a monarchical uh, socialism and stuff like that. So mm. that's the, the narrowest national point of view. Yeah, I mean, didn't wasn't he extremely concerned with the idea that um, I think this is mentioned in the program. Wasn't he concerned with the idea that, like, you know, in order, I think, I can't remember if his terminology was like revolutionary, revolutionary moments, but like, in or, you know, you basically, um, to, to quote Peterson, you know, you got to get your house in order. And uh, I think that was, that was quite a Lasallian. Um, sentiment at the time he his his idea of socialism had to be enacted on a national level um immediately in the idea or the anticipation that this would become a sort of i don't think he ever used the term or at least with regards to marx's referrals to him i don't think the word universal ever came up Mm -hmm. it was this idea of a unity a sort of like an idea fraternity of brotherhood um yeah yeah but it but it begins at it na- yeah but it begins at this national level yeah. whereas i guess marx i think he argues with him on the idea that you know there was what is it yeah that well the fucking term term isn't it workers <laughs> of the world unite, unite like, exactly. I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. um it's it's in it, it but it doesn't have it doesn't appear to have that that national um uh focus at the beginning at the early stages um so i guess that would be a point of contention with marx with regards to la salle but that sounds like that was integral to sort of his belief was it had to be it had to be um it had to be uh, i guess yeah applied initially at a national level to begin with you had to have your own nation in check first for marx or la salle la salle for la salle yeah i mean marx marx says like yeah the like obviously the domestic fear uh, the domestic sphere is the primary side of workers' struggle because that's that's their experience. And that's you you work on a national framework mm-hmm. in that respect only as you're building um, a more sort of um, self aware working class movement. But as, as I mean, as soon as you you have the capacity to do so, you're you're reaching across borders because you're because I mean, obviously the the struggle against capitalism is international anyway. Uh, so it, it's not national uh, in content, but only in form in that respect, o- only in terms of the realities that y- y- what you're working with, I guess. You still there? Yeah. Okay, sorry. No, <laughs> I, I don't have you on screen. You, let, oh, okay. Now I was letting you finish your point. <laughs> no, that was it. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so what he felt... Um, he felt this was the LaSalle, well, not the Lasallian framework of the present day national state um, was a, a renouncing of internationalism. Mm-hmm. Right, well, that's section one. Section two is short, thankfully. Um, I think they're all fairly, they're like, well, 
I think section four is like two or three pages, but I think section section two and three are fairly short. Based on the based on the based on these principles, the SPD sought by legal means a free state and a socialist society, the abolition of the wage system and wages, the iron law of wages that is, and uh, exploitation in every form, and the removal of all social and political inequality. That sounds awesome. Let's have that. Hmm. Uh, hey. do, do, does this? Um, I don't think it does actually, but. I was going to ask, you mentioned the state earlier on. It, it, this isn't where he outlines the, what you're talking about, is it? No, that's that's further further down the okay. chapter. Actually, I think it's four. I think it's four where he really starts to to get into it. Because okay. um, I think he, he actually, I can't remember. I think it was here. I think he actually starts like a chapter where he says, I'll get to the free state bit in a minute. Yes, and then yes, he, yes. And then he doesn't touch it for like two seconds. Yes, that's, a, that's that there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's just like, I'm coming back to this. Like I found that with, with Marx, he seemed, throughout this document, he seemed to like to kind of point and go, I'm coming back to this. Like it's a point of contention, yeah, but we'll be back. Hold my coat. Yeah, exactly. Um, I'm going to put a pin in this. Put a pin in this for later because I've got to rip the rest of this to shreds. Then I'll come back to that bit. Um, but yeah, no, he mentions it at the beginning and then moves swiftly on. So I think, what is it? The law, the iron law wages is something he der- he's deriding LaSalle for, um, mm. for coming up for. It was like, like, you know, something like a badge of honor. I feel from reading this, that LaSalle, like, you know, this is his concept and he just threw, because I think this, um, does he say that this is, this statement is basically, from again from the first international and um and la salle just or, or his supporters just threw in this iron law of wages uh just to sort of um you know just to piss on a stick and um it's it, marx's issue with it is that it implies um a sort of a natural a natural element like a Malthus, um Malthusian theory of population sort of, uh, I, th- I believe, suggests. I, I, I study Malthus, but not in this, not this side of it. But I believe Marx is saying that it suggests um, a natural order of um, a natural hierarchy in terms of access to resources, to material resources. Oh, okay. And the, and that's the sort of like the, the iron law of wages uh, appears to um, appears to insinuate this also. Uh, which is obviously lends itself to a sort of reactionary um, and conservative um, ideology. And basically Marx is just saying, listen, if you're going to abolish wages, the wage system, then why do you need to abolish the iron law of wages also? Okay. Yeah. It must be recognized that wages are, are not merely the value or price of labor. And I think that's, uh, that's the, is that the classical, um, the classical economics perspective? The um, the mistake that he argues in Capital that they make that um, wages, you you work, and in the free market, um, uh, your boss will value your labor, and they will give you uh, what they feel it's worth. And that's and that's all wages are. But of course, capital reveals um, the more sort of inner workings of wages uh, in terms of the generation of surplus value. Hmm. Uh, and so it's not it's not just the price of labor that wages represents, but it's the um, it's the it's the what the fuck was the term the um, it's the variable um, the variable cost of production. Um, alongside the constant cost which is the means of production and the um the surplus value so like if uh i'm trying to think of a if you buy if you buy a product you pay 50 if you pay 100 quid for a product uh the person that sold it to you if 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 it comes from their factory um they've charged you 100 quid because if, <clears throat> 30 quid why is my throat so dry all of a sudden 
because we've been talking for three hours <laughs> 30 quid <laughs> is the uh is the cost uh in that product that the tools to make the product costs um yeah, the tools to make it yeah the uh another 30 quid is the is the wages that it costs someone to make the product and the final 30 quid is the surplus value and Marx's argument in capital is that actually the wages are the surplus value plus the wages that were that were paid so of course any society is going to have to invest its wealth in the maintenance of the tools to produce things but in turn after that cost the actual production, the wages, if the wages were really the price of labor, then it would be the entire 70 pounds or 70 quid for the product. So that the capitalist is, is sort of um, renting the tools to the laborer to produce the product and charging the, the arbitrarily stated 30 quid, the surplus value for it, is isn't in classical economics and that's what capital brings to the table it's um value is highly underlay uh on value labor is highly undervalued uh and there is an enormous amount of theft uh underway and and that is capitalism mm-hmm. um and la salle's iron law wages sort of insinuates uh not insinuates in this stage, but uses the um, the classical economist uh, perspective. Um, it's not recognizing that wages are not merely the value or price of labor, but as per capital, are actually the value or price of labor power. Uh, la- the distinction there being labor being um, labor being the the total productive um, process, I guess, and labor power being the the sort of aspect that's receiving the wages uh, as distinct from the entire labor process, which includes uh, the surplus value. Did I get that across clearly? Uh, yeah. <laughs> and and uh, yeah, he says that it reveals uh, LaSalle's concept as being bourgeois, uh, situated historically uh, and overruling any natural law. Oh no, this reveals a concept as bourgeois situating it historically. Yeah, sorry. Capital situates LaSalle's um, concept as being bourgeois, uh, putting it in its historical place, and um, also reveals that there's nothing natural about the uh, the sort of the system of wages. Hmm. Oh, and actually, that's where he, he brings up the uh, we brought this up earlier as well. That the, the the shift of perception on wages here reveals that a laborer may only live if they work a certain amount of time for free for the capitalists. Oh. And he says um, the system of wage labor is consequently a system of slavery, increasing in severity commensurately with the development of the social productive forces of labor, irrespective of whether the worker is then better or worse paid. So that you know, when uh, I think I outlined, illustrated that earlier with the um, the displaced peasantry uh, losing the access to the means of production and having to work uh, to survive, mm. basically. Yep. Yep. The removal of all social and political inequality. Uh, Marx just. Um, says that should read with the abolition of class distinctions all forms of social and political equality will disappear of their own accord and that's interesting particularly for today isn't it like with the uh, the charges of um, class reductionism mm. uh, being bandied about on social media the the belief that um our society um in a classless form um gets to renegotiate fundamentally social and political inequalities. Uh, so Marx here is saying they will disappear of their own accord, whereas um, many left-wing commentators with the experience of the 20th century behind them since this statement have argued that we know, in very commas, that that's not the case, that um, social, for let's take social inequalities, um, <clears throat> will not disappear of their own accord with the abolition of class. However, of course, 
where has class been abolished? Um, <clears throat> considering the, the first phase and advanced phase of communism that uh, Marx outlines above, um, can we can we consider any any actually existing communism to have ever achieved uh, the advanced phase of communism? And I mean, is it even possible to do so if there is even uh, a singular dominating country, let alone an entire global system operating capitalism? You know, like there, there has mm -hmm. to be like, as long as sort of capitalism is whirring away on the borders of any given communist society, uh, it's always going to be impacting and affecting it, whether through outright conflict, mm -hmm. uh, war, invasion, and other forms of subterfuge, or it's going to be impacting it economically because um, I, I don't know, I mean... I literally don't know. I can't back up like how sort of interdependent a global economy is outside of capitalism. But I would imagine that if some, if a capitalist force that say amounts to anything less than 50% of the world's economy, um, I'm sure it still has, you know, even 30%, if it's still powerful, I'm sure it still has access to, to essential, um, uh, re resources that uh, that, uh, that that the rest of the communist world will still have to engage somewhat in capitalism in, sure. and also um, you would imagine that um, particularly at like an a, 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 a more secure and therefore more democratic and open communist society um, wouldn't so heavily regulated capitalist endeavor and enterprise i mean secure because it feels that overwhelmingly people uh, will be provided for regardless but you would still imagine people um if there's still capitalism somewhere people will engage in it mm -hmm. so we don't we're not going to have classless society until until just capitalism is binned sure i mean i can imagine i mean just as an aside i can uh... I guess I also see the if you have these sort of like pockets of communism, communist societies attempting to flourish, and the um, this insistent, constant presence of capitalism uh, in you know perpetrating from other perpetuating sorry rather perpetuating from other countries, um, if if there was any impact or influence attempting to come from those communist countries, uh, sorry, from the capitalist countries, which I, which I think historically we've seen most instances of communism are usually quashed very immediately, um, whether it's through militaristic force or whether it's through market force. Um, that in and of itself, and again, this might, this is very much an aside, I can see that directly impacting any kind of efforts to create any kind of international solidarity. Oh, if a country, sure. if a country is far more, um, if a country is being belted at from all angles, <laughs> from all sides, um, from, you know, whether it's militaristic or market force, um, you're going to be far too fucking busy to try, to try and even attempt any kind of international solidarity with these other yeah. countries. You would well, hope so. You would hope, so. you would hope. But I, I mean, there was there was powerful. degrees of um, international solidarity through the 20th century, obviously. But like for four places that um, you know did successfully struggle against capitalism um, to to a degree. But I think I think that the key stumbling block is the is the notion that having done so, uh, irrespective of of an international situation and solidarity um, or otherwise, having done so that they can then, as you put it, because they are so busy and occupied, that they can sort of um, relinquish the... If, if a country is struggling against America or Europe 
in a, an anti-capitalist struggle internally in that country, whether like across the decades, regardless of um, regardless of how settled that society seems in any, in any given decade, even um, mm-hmm. there's still an internal struggle between capitalism and communism going on mm-hmm. because capitalism exists on the outside. And this, there's still a revolution going on just because it hasn't, um, you know, just because it didn't, it didn't happen like, like, uh, the October revolution. Mm. Um, you know, let alone one night over decades, like, you know, I'm thinking of Vietnam or whatever from, from like sort of what Luna or it was using this book to defend. There's still a revolution going on. There's still, there's still reactionary forces within that society they might not be you know um they might not be the white army but they're still they're still fucking shit up they're still detracting from the process there's sure. and and whatever power that um that a uh, that that the communist nodal point in that society has consolidated and is practicing even in a settled situation it doesn't amount to any sort of totalizing power where they just get to say capitalism is gone it's still a class society Mm. hey kitten um do you want to look at do you look at point three sure yeah so we just start from the from the top um go for it the german workers party in order to pave the way to the solution of the social question demands the establishment of producers, cooperative societies with state aid under the democratic control of the toiling people. The producers cooperative societies are to be called into being for industry and agriculture on such a scale that the socialist organization of the total labor will arise from them. Um, I think this is Marx's suspicion of uh, LaSalle's statism, isn't it? Yeah, I think this is, we sort of, we kind of brushed on some of the points that I think Marx brings up in this section, which was, again, this is, I think, LaSalle starting to, well, the LaSallean influence on how um, how things should be. <laughs> um, LaSallean's influence on, I think, generally how, yeah, the kind of, the kind of structure that's implied it within moving for moving i guess into the how well yeah labor is going to be structured from this point on um the the social question i think eluded me to be honest that was something that i wasn't entirely entirely sure well just with regards to pave the way to the solution of the social question um it slightly eluded me in case this was something in case this was a particular a particular point that was has been mentioned before or whether he just means social question as a generalization as in you know the workers party the the, the social question is part of this whole kind of uh um well, I think Marx is it. Um, is it Marx feels that this sort of uh, discards the existing class struggle in favor of uh, um, consideration of this social question. Um, I th- instead of a revolutionary process of social transformation in society, the socialist organization of the whole labor arises from state aid to producers' cooperatives, which the state, not the workers, call into being. So, uh, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I don't have it in front of me either. Like, so I'm not, I can't say exactly what the social question is, just it's negative for Marx, which is the, Mm -hmm. uh, the idea that, um, state aid and, and again, it's like, like, I know he did it arbitrarily above, but not really arbitrarily. This this society can mean state or private property, either of which amount to class or to a class is a uh, situation. So yeah. it's ridiculous uh, to believe that the state can fund such transformation that the class struggle is, um, or that, that sorry, the working class is um, that both 
how both Marx and LaSalle have supposedly um, decided was going to be the case. Mm -hmm. Okay. It might've been that it might've just been that I was, I was picking up on that as being, I'm, I'm kind of trying to like manifest the social question as being something that is actually referenced somewhere. Whereas maybe it's just, it's, it's, I'm over, I'm being too literal perhaps uh, with it. But I guess, yeah, this contention with the idea of state aid um, being, I suppose, injected into cooperative societies. But it's still, again, this point that Marx is contesting, I guess, this idea that it still implies a, a central state. I don't, yeah. think, I don't think anywhere in this, in this paragraph that it's implying that it's in any way, shape, or form a cooperative society as state. Yeah, like exactly. the uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. are living are a living state. It's not yeah. actually it. It's sim- it's it's implying a centralized, possibly even top down model. Exactly. Like it's not. And that that's the discarding of the the class struggle element. It's like uh, the idea that cooperatives are fine, um, but they are useless if they are not vociferously independent of state and private property. Hmm. Um. That, what, do you know why he makes the point? Uh, never mind. The um, the so obviously, obviously, uh, I don't know if you've read Hal Draper, and maybe we should do a podcast on his um, book, the Two Two Souls of Socialism, whatever. It's about the, the um, socialism from above and social socialism from below, and um, obviously, there's like you know, it's a meme that uh, that Marx is. Um, Marx implies an anti-democratic and authoritarian society, but actually Marx spent most of his work criticizing, like we, like we suggested before, the, uh, the authoritarianism of utopian mm. um, and even changed the, um, the, the, int- the preface, I think, or the introduction to the Communist Manifesto from you know, the earlier, the initial call to occupy the state after the Paris Commune and to, where he saw like what the um, what the working class were capable of in in an insurrectionary moment, he 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 changed the um, the, the 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 manifesto to say, excuse me, to say um, smash the state. Um, and that's definitely something we will cover because I think we should definitely be doing Lenin um, soon. He makes that point, and so so where he, where where Marx would appear to take. Where sort of the 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 program appears to take a democratic stance under the democratic control of the working people, Marx's critique of this uh, would appear then that he is being anti-democratic. Um, perhaps I think like uh, he is taking de- the word democratic here to mean by the rule of the people. Um, so it's like under the rule of the people of the rule of the people or something like that, like um, control by the rule of the people of the working people. So I mean, I think, I think he's just sort of saying it's, it's a bit of a nonsense uh, in supporting these demands. Those working people illustrate that neither do they rule nor mature enough to rule. And um, that the principle sort of, yeah, as a whole, represents a, a retreat from the standpoint of a of a class movement. I mean, because it's because it's state funded. Uh, to that of a sectarian one, if workers seek to create the conditions for cooperative production on a social and initially national scale, this is an attempt to revolutionise. Or I suppose this has to be an attempt to revolutionise the present conditions of production. So it's it's um it's like those localised practising. Um, practicing alternatives it's it, it doesn't amount it'll it won't amount to the alternative but it's practicing and and building sort of um building the possibilities of that alternative uh-huh. um existing cooperative societies are only valuable if they are independent creations of, of the workers and not funded by governments and the bourgeoisie sure so that's 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 pretty much exactly what we've i think we've been kind of kind of poking at this whole way down again marx is making that point and saying yeah like i think these 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 cooperative societies are absolutely you know i I think he's he's noting absolutely the worth 
in these societies and their existence, but considering them within the like the current structure, um, therein kind of lies the I guess I guess yeah, just how easily they can be re re amalgamated back into the into the re you know reshuffled back into the fold or co opted. I said bizarrely, um, yeah, sort of co opted back into. Well, again, they they it's not seeking to go past it 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 very much is practicing but within the current structure or the current order um it won't it won't amount to much i think i think that's what he's saying is that again um there has to be momentum behind it and then a willingness to push forward Mm. because if they become dependent on state aid you're sucking on the missile cock well yeah yeah (laughs) That's that's a, that's only going to go down with a few people. Um, Sorry, <laughs> um, you're, you're yeah, the coolest it, people, though. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I mean, considering the idea, I mean, that definitely the first thing that I was I raised an eyebrow to was this this inception, uh, this or this conceptions rather, of state aid had to be implemented. But for me, instantly, that made me consider, well, what, again, what do we consider here as state? Who do you consider mm. to be running as state? Why is it separate from these cooperative societies yeah. that you feel need to take advantage of this aid? Um, you know, it's all good and well saying that they may operate in a, in, a democ- in a democratic way. But again, there's a lot left to be... Um, sort of sought after in that description of what what democracy in that in that scenario uh within that relationship between state state aid and and cooperative societies what does democracy look like within you know between those two those two entities yeah um and yeah so it 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 definitely felt like it again marx is just bringing up and going there's a lot left to the imagination exactly here and because you know how much of it is how much of it is sorry yeah, no, but and and how much of it is different? I mean, I think you know. Again, he makes points later on about you know the ideas of free education and saying, yeah, free education is fantastic, but then points out instances where it's there. So, I mean, you could say <laughs> yeah. the same, and just saying no, you've but you've got it. So why the fuck are you getting pissy and moany about it? Like yeah, you've yeah, got yeah. it over there. There, it's happening in Switzerland or whatever, you know. Um, so I mean, I I think that that's something that for me I can very easily take away i mean it'd be something that i would absolutely be able to apply to my own my own analysis of things being able to take away and look and go yeah on paper this absolutely sounds fantastic and even today i could see myself going oh wow cooperative societies oh wow you know state aid the word aid in there sounds great i like that yeah Yeah, we like state aid but absolutely not in any way shape or form considering the structure of these things what is the state in this what is the relationship between these two entities you know, again, what is what does society look like to to a Las, in a Lasallian lens? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, why? That's poor Rosa. Yeah, and that's yeah. So so yeah, I I sort of got the the sense that he was kind of poking at the same thing, trying to underline the same the same issues. I think that um, that beautifully brings us to the final discussion on the state that uh, I feel I feel definition for, but that's four a. So just so we can so we can sign off on that, uh, a quick comment I think on four B, it's um, mm-hmm. it's six parts, and I think it's just him saying that the phraseology is too vague. Generally, um, I'm happy to skip it and just just focus on the state. Yeah, I think those were just specifications that he's yeah. he's looking for. He's just like, what does this mean? Yeah. <laughs> like he's I just mean, again. I'm- He's, yeah, he's just could, I suppose we're like totally reading. wildly open there to anyone who like is fully sort of you know is fully embedded into this work and uh, we just go oh my god what are you talking about you can't just ignore this shit um, but right now we're going to I'm going to that's my vote my vote is to ignore it and just to talk about 4A the free basis of the state and and be done be done with you hmm. what do you think I'm I'm fine with that. Cool. I think if we if we feel if anybody um, feels uh, you know that we've we'll block them, Ali. Yeah. Oh, we'll sorry, I forgot. Them. Oh, I forgot we have that. Don't we? <laughs> we can do that. I forgot. Sorry, I'm so used to having conversations with people in real life. I <laughs> I I forget that I can just block people now. 
Um, no, I mean, if, you know, if people do feel that we've, we've dramatically misinterpreted or, or glanced over something that might lead to, you know, more informed conversation later on down the line, then I would encourage them to reach out about that. Please and do. Talk We're not and talk. No, absolutely not. Like, I mean, the idea here is to get, again, you know, to, I mean, I say this, it's been, you know, three hours, but I mean, the idea here is to, you know, it's, it's, it, this is, this is part of a political education. Um, and if we can involve more people in that, fantastic. So yes. I would say, yeah, to nothing, no, nothing at all is, I mean, we're, we're moving forward quickly, but that's not to say that we won't come back to it. And that's not to say that we will. Exactly. Not. So, yeah. So no, I'm, I'm happy just to, yeah, just skip it. Skip it. Forget everything I just said. Skip it. <laughs> Shoot me with four A so. Cool. Okay. Um, yeah, the I yeah, I actually I have it in front of me and I remember this being this is where he comes back to you. the free basis of the state quotes. From like section two, right? Yeah. Um so he finally gets back to it. And actually, sorry, this is where he starts off with first of all <laughs> um according to two part two. Uh, I, he doesn't specify it's part two, but it's just two Roman numerals, so I'm assuming he means it's part two. The German Workers' Party strives for the free state. Free state? What is this? <laughs> this is how we should do the whole thing. And again, and I, I feel, yeah, no, this was absolutely where he just comes back. And I think, again, this was this was the section that I, I gained a lot of energy um, because it suddenly started to put into context for me, a lot of the stuff he's been saying before. And again, I think this is where I, I knew what he was poking at the whole way through, but he really is cutthroat in this last section uh, where I feel like he's just really trying to hammer. And again, because it's a very vast, encompassing um, concept that we're talking about here. You know, what is the state? And it's integral to some of these previous policies that they're kind of trying to put forward in the program. Obviously, he's kind of going, well, okay, now we're going to talk about that thing you've been mentioning the whole way through the state. What the fuck are you talking about? Um, yeah. Uh, there. Yeah. I think he, he, well, um, I mean, first and foremost, yeah, he's absolutely um, in contention of this idea that he doesn't feel that it's been, he Marx definitely didn't feel that it, it's, it's, it's accurately sort of, it's not, it's not even said in a way he feels it's nonsensically sort of portrayed. There's not really much there. Uh, it leaves an awful lot to the imagination about what this state. And again, this includes what we were just talking about, this idea of state aid that would be implemented into, into um, cooperative societies. There's been this sort of over this kind of overbearing sense of a top down state being implemented. Mm -hmm. Um, while decorated with the ideas of democracy, while decorated with the ideas of, you know, obviously the society surrounding that state possibly would be, um, you know, a free, open society, you know, with, alive with democracy, um, both in and, and in and outside of the workplace. Um, but it's still never really explained the whole way through. Um, so freedom consists in converting the state from an organ superimposed on society into one thoroughly subordinate to it. And even today, state forms are more or less free depending on the degree to which they restrict the freedom of the state. I don't get that last part, but, um, but I think that, that the idea that like, uh, it's an organ superimposed on society and it should be uh, transformed thoroughly into one subordinate to it uh, that's that's quite um that's quite living living state becoming state that that hmm. gramsci and uh and then mufian um concept it, it is that mark saying that or is that mark saying lasalle says it <laughs> uh i forget it's like it. a, an early quote um because because definitely i'm like yeah 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 definitely that should be that should be a thing um, you know, the state shouldn't be an organ superposed on society. It should be an organ that is thoroughly subordinated to society. But I suppose that might be not Marx stating what he feels, but um, 
being critical of the Lasallian take because he is saying that um, the SPD are treating the state as far too distinct from society and that they should treat existing society as the basis for existing states, which is very similar to the, um, the, the relations of production in determining sort of so many aspects of society as well. Mm-hmm. So it's almost like um, there's like a there's a there's a feed a feed in an out loop from the base. So the economic base is coming into determining so much in society, and then society is determining so much in the state. And there's no real there's no real distinction. There's there's like a, a gradiated blur um, between all of these phases. They're not they're not really all separate things. And um, yeah, so they shouldn't be treating the the state as an independent entity with its own intellectual, ethical, and liberal foundations. Uh, capitalism exists to varying capitalism exists to varying degrees in each country, but their states differ more widely, particularly particularly um, when was it 150 years ago, 100 years ago, 150 years ago, and um, that's um, so. Whereas, like you can talk about capitalism as a as a as a solid entity. Marx is saying there is no the state. There are states or there is a state. Um, though they are, to be fair, um, all grounded in, in modern bourgeois society, uh, despite the varying degree of, of capitalist development within them. And um, between capitalist and communist, oh, no, I think maybe that, that point should be sort of left to the end. But yeah, he's just he's just sort of lambasting them really for, as you said, as you pointed out, like not having a very clear and definitive concept of state there, really, is it? And 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 how because of their phraseology and framing throughout of all the sort of different elements, the need to specify this in particular, um, or or because it hasn't been, sort of leaves leaves it open or leaves everything open to so to so much sort of variation Hmm. um and i mean will this be taking into account you know i mean again this this is this is referring back to i mean this envisionment of the state i suppose must be influenced heavily by lasalle's um nationalist take yeah, it, but also his nationalist take on this, he's, you know, the, the entire concept of how their state will develop surely has something to do with the moment, both materially and historically, the country where they're planning on instigating this program finds itself in, but it's not necessarily something applicable um, across the board. Uh, because obviously countries, countries and nations develop at different rates, both, you know, materially and and. and Italy yeah. or whatever. Exactly. So, so it again, it's implying a very particular. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily implying class, but it's it's implying a particular, I guess, a standing point from where they're coming from, and it's not necessarily something. It it exactly it it implies this standpoint. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think for the most of it, yeah, he's just absolutely tearing them to shreds with this idea, and I suppose that like some of this will be. I guess, kind of influenced, again, like you were, uh, yeah, you said it earlier on. I mean, the influence of the Paris Commune on Marx, this, 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 this sudden realization of just what could be done. I mean, maybe this is, maybe, I don't know if he was expressing this by that point, but, or sorry, yeah, expressing that by this point, um, well, rather. If, I mean, he does say, between capitalist and communist society lies a period of revolution and transformation in the political sphere. And in this period, the state can only take the form of a revolutionary dictatorship of the proletariat. Right. Um, that, that can mean so much. In it, like the big, Obviously, the biggest thing, and this relates to the democratic uh, point I was making a few minutes ago, that the, the term dictatorship in our current society means like... Uh, it, it can't but mean in a very sort of concise way the sort of dictators that we know from our history books um, that arose during the 20th century. And that's what dictatorship means to us. None of those existed back then. I mean, they had their own 
dictators, but not in the modern sense, uh, I don't mm. believe. Um, I mean, dictatorialness um, existed, ruled by dictat. But, uh, but, like, but there's there's specific sort of technical terminology that distinguishes dictatorship that we know in the modern sense from whatever came before. And he taking the, the modern conception in a general sense, if you have a state and you fill it with um, a dictator, a singular dictator, uh, that dictator rules by decree, uh, by diktat, um, and it's a nonsense to then um, interpret the concept a dictatorship in a state, singular dictator in a state of the proletariat, the fucking entire body of working laborers or anyone who doesn't have access to the uh, control over the means of production. Hmm. Um, and well, I'll finish that sentence before qualifying my aunt there. Um, it's a nonsense to assume as you find on, in the alt right, uh, culture or so often that the, the dictatorship of the proletariat the, the diktat of an enormous multitude of people uh, can mean anything close to the diktat of a uh, rule by decree of a singular person Absolutely. um so obviously marx is, does not mean that that uh whatever way um the ussr and and uh, communist china have been portrayed in um in our in our history lessons and in our propaganda um whatever way people feel about the, the how the likes of Stalin and Mao might might have been dictators to attach that to the phrase dictatorship of the proletariat yeah is a nonsense um and yeah, I don't know. Uh, take taking taking into taking that into account. Um, oh yeah, to qualify my and um, if you if you're if you're dismantling the the combination of material elements that result in the relations of production, the capitalist relations of production. If you're if you're dismantling that and reor like under the revolutionary process of reordering those elements and recombining them um you are starting to draw people away from the control over the means of production you're 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 going to a, a factory and you're taking its owner the owner of what was private property and you're placing that private property in the hands of the commune, that owner is no longer a capitalist. It's no longer an owner. They're working class. So the dic they are included in the dictatorship of the proletariat. They are a part of, the, well, they're not proletariat because they're not an industrial worker. But if you, if you, I mean, if you swap in dictatorship of the working class, um, they're there. Like if, 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 if the, if whatever, I mean, this is a huge hypothetical, obviously, and assumes that, um, that a revolutionary moment can be as smooth as going up to a boss and saying, you no longer own this. You're no longer our boss. You can work with us and we'll uh, divide the surplus value, um, evenly between all of us. Um, and assuming they don't have a private force and, uh, a political lobby, basis and end up putting up a, a fight and a struggle if they acquiesce in that situation they're included in that dictatorship and obviously that dictatorship isn't the dictatorship in the way that we we conceive of it it just means that the working class as a democratic whole and an, an inter-negotiating body of society working towards classlessness by its assumption of the means of production is leveling any pre-existing class stratifications um you are you are bringing 
into that body of the dictatorship of the state uh everyone hmm. what is is that is that can is that summed up by the i forget who it was that said it now what was it the the object is not to put the capitalists in the gulags it's to offer them a better deal right yeah yeah i oh do you do you remember who that was i can't remember if it was I know it's either, I, I can't remember if it was Wolf or if it was Zizek. I have a feeling it's Wolf. That seems a little too poetic for Zizek. I feel like he'd, <laughs> I feel like he'd spit his way through that and then just be like, well, actually, that's bullshit. <laughs> but uh, I think it was Wolf. I, I'll try to track it down. But yeah, I don't know. Can that, can, does that, it feels. I mean, I guess, feels, I guess, I guess the flaw in really its relevant. thinking is that, oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. But I guess the flaw in this thinking is that, uh, of course, and even Moof um, concedes that the capitalists won't give up without a struggle. And, you know, of course, the idea that revolution, the idea that revolution is bloody comes from the capitalist revolutions of the French and American um, re- revolutionary period. And the idea that future revolutions will be bloody is because that a vast minority will resist the will, the democratic will, democratic in the, in the pure sense there, of the vast majority. Because the, that minority will have the guns mm. and the majority will just have their, as we've seen in the past, will just have their labor and they will withdraw that and uh, they'll be shot for it. That's that the, the 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 blood of the revolution. That's where that will come from. If you like what you see, please express this emotion through hammering the like button. Indeed, and why not try a subscription also? They're free! You can also find us on Spotify somewhere. We're there. And you can stay abreast of our goings-on over at Twitter. We're omnipotent. Beyond that, why not get involved by leaving some giving words? Or kind words. Or kind words. Or not-so-kind words. Or not-so-kind words in the comment section. Thanks so much for listening.